morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. I know we have a few stragglers still coming in. Um, I, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Kimberly Hamlin. Uh, Hamlin researches, writes, and speaks about the history of women in America for scholarly and pop popular audiences. Her research on women, gender, science, and politics has been featured in media outlets including NPR, CBC Radio, QZ.com, and The Washington Post. She regularly speaks to groups across the country, especially during Women's History Month. Hamlin grew up outside of Syracuse, New York, not far from the historical homes about many of the women that she wrote about. After completing her degree in American Studies at Georgetown University, she worked for U.S. Senator Susan Collins of Maine for four years, first on her successful campaign for Senate and then in her D.C. office. In 2000, Hamlin left Washington to pursue a PhD in American Studies at the University of Texas in Austin. She wrote her master's thesis there on the origins of the Girl Scouts in the United States and served as historical consultant on the PBS film Troop 1500, which chronicles an Austin area Girl Scout troop whose mothers are incarcerated. With the support of a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship, she is currently working on her second book, tentatively titled Woman Citizen, Helen, Hamlin, Helen Hamilton Gardner and Women's Suffrage in America. She is also currently helping to organize national and local efforts to commemorate the upcoming centennial of women's suffrage in 2020. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Kimberly Hamlin. All here together today. It's a real pleasure for me. I also want to uh, emphasize what Clay was saying about the Teddy Roosevelt Digital Archive. I want to give a hearty thanks and a big high five to Sharon and her team who have put together what I would vote as the nation's preeminent public humanities digital archive. It is a truly a wonder to behold, and if you haven't checked it out already, I think you should. It's going to inspire and keep uh, historians and enthusiasts of TR busy for generations to come. It's a real wonder, and they are to be congratulated on this wonderful achievement. <clears throat> I also want to thank my fellow presenters, Virginia, Stacy, and Catherine. I'm honored to be on this year's program with you all, and big thanks for all of you for coming out today. I see a lot of students in the audience, or some students. I hope that you will stay, and I hope that you will participate after and ask questions. I'll call on you if you don't. Um, and I'm really excited to be here in North Dakota. It's my first time, so I really look forward to keeping these conversations going with you throughout uh, today and the rest of tomorrow. Thank you. In 1913, readers of American Magazine were asked to vote for the greatest American man. Of course, everyone here knows who won, hands down, duh. But why? What made Teddy Roosevelt so great? Everyone in this room probably has their own answer to that question. But what I want to stress here today is that TR's greatness was inseparable from his perceived manliness. In other words, he did not win, and maybe would not have won, a contest for the greatest American, or even the greatest person. But he was, beyond a doubt, the greatest American man, then and many would say even now. In the wake of the Civil War, TR lived through an era of unprecedented change and social upheaval, especially in terms of gender roles. TR was both an example of these changes as well as an active agent of them. Of course, TR's manliness had important ramifications for femininity and women. And I want to suggest here today, and you can argue with me after, and I hope that you will, that TR's ideas about gender were not somehow tangential to his important progressive reforms and foreign policies, but rather foundational to them. That his ideas about what makes a great nation, a great country, were very much rooted in his ideas about manhood and womanhood. In many ways, we are still living in TR's world today. Just yesterday, I saw scores of men arriving at the Bismarck Airport for their annual hunting trip to the Dakotas to revise their vitality out west. Men like my grandfather, George Fairchild, born in 1918, the year before TR died, and who couldn't go to college because he had to work on the family farm, but he nevertheless worked his way up to become a safety manager at DuPont. 
For many years, my grandfather's greatest joy was to travel from Tawanda, Pennsylvania to Gettysburg, South Dakota for his annual hunting trip, where he could take a break from paper pushing and report filling out to restore his manhood in the West. So yes, for better or worse, in many ways, we still live in TR's world today. But what exactly did it mean to be a man in the age of Teddy Roosevelt? From what sources and what experiences did TR derive his ideas about how men were supposed to behave? And perhaps we should back up a minute and say, first, what do we mean by gender? Gender refers to the cultural meanings associated with being a man or being a woman. For historians like me, gender is fascinating to study because it is constantly contested, changing, and under construction. Even though we may think of maleness and femaleness as timeless and immutable, our ideas about gender are constantly in flux. What it, mean, what it meant for TR's dad, Thee, to be a good man in the 1850s was not at all the same as what it meant to be a good man in the 1880s when TR came of age. At the same time, our ideas about gender inform larger debates about the economy, the military, domestic and foreign spending, science, religion, the environment, just to name a few. And our ideas about gender operate on a complex matrix that includes not only sex, but also race and class. As we will see today, TR's version of manhood was not in fact universal. TR's version of manhood was very much bound up in ideas about whiteness. So back to TR. When TR was overwhelmingly selected as America's greatest man in 1913, what did that mean to people? What was so manly about him? What words or traits were associated with TR? And here I'm inviting you to yell out some words. What was so manly about him? What words do we hear that resonate and describe his particular brand of mess? Pardon? Hunter? Cowboy? Strenuous? Integrity. Integrity. What else? Adventure, how about over here? Fearless, vigorous, honest. Oh, daring, yes, renaissance man. That's a great one. These are just some of my thoughts that I think you all are adding some excellent ones. Renaissance man I love, he wasn't just a rough and tumble man, he was an educated man, a thoughtful man, a man of letters. What else? that we should add to our list. Are we good? Strong? I also want to highlight virile, virility. That's going to be another theme of our talk today. But I think together we came up with a pretty good list of some of the reasons why TR was selected as the greatest American man. Now these would not have been the words or traits associated um, with manhood in the 1850s or 1860s of the men of TR's father's era, even Abraham Lincoln. In pre-bellum Knickerbocker world to which TR was born, being a good man meant personal probity, virtue, financial independence and prudence, paying one's bills, earning the trust of one's neighbors and colleagues, being self-sufficient, being stoic and restrained. Now for all his many attributes, I do not think that anyone would describe TR as having been stoic and restrained. What prompted the seismic shift in ideas about manhood at the end of the 19th century? Historians have identified many causes, most of them linked to the Civil War and its aftermath. For one thing, the Civil War greatly accelerated what historian Alan Trachtenberg has famously termed the incorporation of America. And this means the shift from self-sufficiency in agriculture and apprentice-based trades to modern industrial capitalism. Rather than farm your own land or hang your own shingle outside your shoe shop, now most men worked for large corporations, some on the factory floor, others in soulless offices above, processing the endless assortment of paper generated by the new corporate system. The stapler, for example, was invented or patented in 1877. Need I say more? If a man could no longer till his soil, work his trade, or settle his own land in the West, what did it mean to be a man? How did the new generation of paper pushers understand their manhood? 
Tiar feared that, men, feared that men like himself had become too insulated from the struggle for existence and were becoming over-civilized. Even more threatening, the tragic and unprecedented loss of life during the Civil War opened up new avenues for women in higher education and in the professions. There were simply no longer enough men to go around, so single women began supporting themselves. All of these factors prompted what historians often call a crisis in masculinity, to which TR provided a solution. But beyond these structural forces of change, TR's solution to the crisis of masculinity was also an intellectual one. After all, before TR became a rancher, a rough rider, or a bull moose, he was a historian and an amateur scientist. And it was his understanding of history and science and especially the new science of evolution that framed how he understood the differences between the sexes and why he thought maintaining these differences was so important. Throughout much of the 18th and 19th century, American understanding of gender roles were largely drawn from the Bible, and in particular, from the Garden of Eden creation story. Eve was created from Adam's rib to be his helpmate, until she ate fruit from the tree of knowledge, causing the couple's exile from Eden, as well as her eternal curse of pain and childbirth. These biblical gender roles were extrapolated in sermons and ladies' magazines throughout the first half of the 19th century. That woman was inherently unclean, untrustworthy, and designed by God and nature to be man's helpmate was seen as timeless and inevitable. Women's rights activists and female abolitionists repeatedly came up against Eve when they asked for the right to speak in public, the right to go to college, and the right to retain their personhood in marriage. In these cases, the resounding answer was always no. Why? Why can't women go to school? Eve. Why can't women speak in public? Eve. Why can't women be more equal in marriage? Eve. But, and this is what I study um, in my first book, which is outside, you may have seen it, but in the 1860s and 1870s, Darwinian evolution fundamentally changed the way many Americans, including the budding naturalist T.R., thought about the origins of life on Earth and what it meant to be human, including what it meant to be male and female. This is not to say that T.R. gave up his religious faith. He did not. Like most Americans, he simply accommodated his evolutionary beliefs within his Christian faith, understanding that it was God who put evolution in motion. But yet, and still, evolutionary theory offered different ways to think about the differences between the sexes. In a Darwinian universe, males were bestowed with a wide variety of traits, brilliant plumage, large tusks, and they engaged more fully and more vigorously in the daily tasks associated with survival. They competed with each other for food and access to mates, and as everyone knows, only the fittest survived. Female animals, on the other hand, selected their mates from a field of male competitors, heightening the stakes of male competition. It wasn't enough simply to get the food. If you wanted to pass on your traits to the next generation, you also had to get yourself picked by the female. The popularized version of Darwinian evolution also included a racial component. Darwin, and even more so his many followers in Europe and America, suggested that races, as well as individuals, competed with each other for survival and for superiority. And by race, they sometimes meant skin color, and they sometimes meant nationality or ethnicity. The popular evolutionary text that T.R. read while at Harvard and throughout his life argued that white Anglo-Europeans and Americans represented the peak, the top, the heights of evolution, while more savage races, that was the word often used, were at the bottom of this evolutionary ladder. According to Darwin, one key element and sign of this evolutionary advancement was the differentiation between the sexes. He argued that the most civilized or advanced peoples had men doing much more distinct things from their women. But white superiority was not assured under this evolutionary model. In a competitive Darwinian environment, change was the only constant, as opposed to the Bible where things were fixed. As white American men supposedly lost vigor and virility, and as women began encroaching more and more on male spheres, men like TR worried about the nation's prospects. 
What if white American men were no longer the world's most vigorous evolutionary specimens? As TR wrote in The Winning of the West, a certain softness of fiber in civilized nations, which if it were proved to be progressive, might mean the development of a cultured and refined people quite unable to hold its own in those conflicts through which alone any great race can ultimately march to victory. According to TR, nothing was worse than what he called national emasculation. TR saw his own childhood asthma and health struggles as signs not only of effeminacy, but also as a result of his over-civilization. And that is precisely what he came here to the Dakotas to cure. Social anxiety about evolutionary understandings of gender can also be seen in the late 19th century epidemic of hypertrichosis, the disease of superfluous hair. And at the same time, the popular fascination with bearded ladies. Here on the left, we have Viola M. She was the first case study of hypertrichosis. She went to visit Dr. Lewis During, who was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, for insight as to her curious condition. During was so fascinated with her that he brought her to all of his classes at Penn State, or University of Pennsylvania Medical School, and he, wrote, he published his case study of her, The Case of a Bearded Woman. Dr. During and his students wondered, was Viola a woman? She was married, she had had two children, she had nursed these two children, but she had a beard. Were bearded women female? He wasn't so sure. At the same time, popular audiences flocked to see bearded women such as Crow. She's on the right. As a young girl, Crow was captured in Laos by an explorer and exhibited across the world, eventually settling in America, to be displayed as Darwin's missing link. When audiences looked at Crow, they weren't puzzling so much over whether or not she was a man or a woman, but whether or not she was a human or an animal. She was presented as a missing link in the chain of evolution. How can we understand this fascination at the end of the 19th century with female facial hair? I'm sure this is not a surprise to you, but women since time immemorial have struggled, battled, embraced facial hair. Little chin hair, some beards, some mustaches is a constant, but it became a disease, an epidemic in 1877, six years after the publication of Darwin's book, The Descent of Man, where he applied evolutionary theory to humans. Hypertrichosis soon reached epidemic proportions and is written about in countless medical and dermatological books. Dermatologists reported seeing superfluous hair, as they called it, on women all around them. Doctors advised women to undergo all sorts of painful treatments, including even carcinogenic radiation to remove their facial hair, even though they knew this would cause their female patients to uh, get cancer and in some cases die. They argued that anything was worse than facial hair. Why? According to Darwin, the sex-based distinction of facial hair, men have beards, women generally don't, was a distinctly human phenomenon and among the most important markers of sex difference. While all mammals have fur, only humans have shed their fur, with the exception of male beards. But from an evolutionary perspective, sex-based beards makes no sense. Males and females, men and women, survive in the same environments. From a survival standpoint, then it makes no sense why men should have evolved to have beards and women not. Believe it or not, the evolution of female hairlessness in women was one of the most hotly debated aspects of Darwin's The Descent of Man. Darwin eventually argued, and throughout this book attempted to prove, that the reason that only men evolved to have beards had nothing to do with survival, but everything to do with reproduction. Women, he argued, had found beards attractive. Over millions of years, women had selected for men with beards, while men had selected for women without beards. Much like the peacock's bright plumage from an evolutionary standpoint, this makes no sense. The peacock's beautiful feathers are basically saying to predators, here I am, please eat me. How then has this evolved? The same thing Darwin argues, this is a, a reproduction. Female peahens choose the peacocks with the most beautiful plumage. Therefore, this has survived over millions of years as a trait. 
This is, in a nutshell, is Darwin's theory of sexual selection, which he introduced in The Descent of Man, in which Darwin believed until his dying day was an even more important evolutionary mechanism than the much better known natural selection. And there's been several um, recent books in the past couple years arguing a similar thing. You may have seen them excerpted in the New York Times and elsewhere. In a Darwinian world, hairlessness separated humans from the other mammals and beards separated men from women. So what then did it mean for women to have beards? Were they still women? Even though beards generally came with no other uh, negative symptoms for women, they underwent painful, even deadly treatments simply because they felt that beards made them less attractive to men. As you can see in countless uh, hair removal ads and medical journals that survive to this day. So I think this example really shows how Americans are grappling with this new understanding of what it means to be male or female. On what evidence are we drawing our ideas about how men are supposed to be and our women are supposed to be? It's a tremendous time of transition and flux when TR is coming of age. When TR headed to North Dakota in 1884, mustache intact, to remake himself as a man, these were some of the ideas and developments that shaped his thinking, both consciously and subconsciously. In this, he was not alone. Beginning in the 1880s, several men used the newly available visual and technological tools, magazines, photographs, even moving pictures, to recreate the meaning of manhood in this corporate and Darwinian world by focusing on their manly strength, fitness, martial preparedness, and especially virility. Images of these new manly men, very much distinct from earlier 19th century models of masculinity, began to permeate per popular culture, inspiring and paving the way for the triumph of the cowboy of the Dakotas. In 1894, Eugene Sandow became famous as the first professional bodybuilder. Known as the perfect man, Sandow's fame coincided with the aftermath of the massive 1893 economic crash and depression. A man could no longer control his economic fate, but he could control his body. In the Library of Congress, I, I had a link in here, but I don't think we have um, Wi-Fi in here, but the Library of Congress, I encourage you to Google it on your phone, has a great video uh, recorded by Thomas Edison, one of his earliest attempts at motion pictures, showing Sandow performing, flexing his muscles and his fig leaf, showing audiences his manly feats of strength. Audiences paid top dollar to see Sandow's muscles at vaudeville theaters across the country, and his feats were chronicled in new magazines, such as Physical Culture, published by Bernard McFadden, the inventor of the penis scope, which we can talk more about later if you want. Harry Houdini, the greatest escape artist of all time, who was even seen by TR's daughter, daughter Ethel, also came to fame during this time. For men whose daily lives increasingly revolved around thankless paper stapling in anonymous office buildings, answering to an endless chain of corporate management whose movements were controlled by train schedules and newly installed time clocks, Houdini was thrilling and liberating to watch. As Houdini escaped from literal handcuffs, chains, even prisons, men could imagine escaping their own metaphorical chains. In 1912, Edgar Rice Burroughs created the ultimate fantasy of escape from both corporate and domestic life, Tarzan of the Apes. Here again, you can also see the interest in evolutionary themes and the fascination with human-animal kinship. When he began writing Tarzan comics, Burroughs was employed as a manager of the business service department at a business magazine called System. The magazine capitalized on workers' anxieties. How are they gonna make it in this new anonymous corporate world? And offered business advice for a fee. And you can see here in this ad, how big of a man are you? Really the fears that the workers had that brought them to buy magazines such as System. One of the um, admonitions in this ad says, your weekly pay envelope will answer the question, how big of a man are you? If you're not making enough money, if you're not rising the corporate ladder fast enough, you must not be manly enough. Despite the fact that he had zero business success himself, one of Burroughs' jobs was to answer the plaintive letters he received from men 
begging for expert advice on how to succeed in this strange new world of the corporate office. Needless to say, Burroughs hated his job. So he wrote his own escape plan via Tarzan, a man competing for his own survival, far removed from the modern constraints and modern systems. For so perfectly capturing his audience's fantasy life, Burroughs was able to quit System Magazine and become a very rich man. From these examples, I hope that you will see that TR was part and parcel of a much larger remaking of manhood through popular culture at the turn of the 20th century. But of all these avatars of the new masculinity, TR offered the most comprehensive and compelling model. He's the total package, right? Strength, freedom, and virility. And unlike Sandow, Houdini, or Burroughs, TR had the opportunity to write his ideas about manhood into law and public practice. Crucial to TR's version of masculinity was that he was white. The strenuous virile masculinity that he represented would have been downright unacceptable, deadly even, for African American men and men of color to emulate during this time. To give you just one example, it would be impossible to imagine Jack Johnson, who became the first black heavyweight boxing champion in 1908, it would be impossible to imagine him appearing in a publicity photo with a rifle in the same way that TR, the Rough Rider rancher, often appeared with guns. Jack Johnson's penchant for flaunting his well-earned uh, fancy cars and clothes and his regular defeats of white fighters on his way to becoming world championship boxer often incited mob violence against African Americans in several states. And in 1912, Johnson was arrested under the Mann Act and convicted by an all-white jury for crossing state lines with his white girlfriend. You may have read the news recently that he was granted a, post, a posthumous pardon by President Trump, and this is some of the context in case you saw those headlines. To be a good man, TR would assert time and again, meant first and foremost being a good provider to one's wife and children, being able to overcome obstacles, fighting when necessary, never ever shrinking from the call of duty, and living a life of boldness and adventure. TR always grounded his claims about masculinity in the family because to him and many of his compatriots, the family, not the individual, was the building block of the nation and the state and as Roosevelt would say, the race. Strong families meant strong communities and a strong America. These gendered ideals that man should be the strong soldier and woman the brave mother shaped Roosevelt's approach to both foreign and domestic policy. And I'm gonna give you just a couple examples of this. Led by the historian Kristen Hoganson, scholars have traced the gendered origins of the U.S. involvement in both the Spanish-American War and the Philippine-American War. Roosevelt and the other men in his cohort were concerned that American men were becoming weak and over-civilized. Men of their generation had missed the opportunity to fight in the Civil War, and they needed other challenges in which they could prove their mettle. When Roosevelt assembled his team of rough riders, he denied most of the enthusiast, enthusiastic applicants, and he did not necessarily select soldiers for their martial abilities. Rather, he selected the men who epitomized his ideals of manhood, Western cowboys, Ivy League athletes, and he etched this version of manhood in American minds by bringing along camera crews to capture their exploits and victories. After the peace treaty with Spain, Roosevelt was despondent. The Spanish-American War had not lasted long enough. TR had not even managed to get injured, which he re really regretted. He saw another opportunity in the Philippines. Now, this is a curious historical development because the U.S. went to war with Spain so that the, colony, the Spanish colonies would have the right to self-government. And then a few years later, we went to war with the Philippines so that we could be the imperial power overseeing the Philippines. So it was a, a, shi a rhetorical and uh, a shift in our policy. Imperialists like Roosevelt and his friend Harry, Henry Cabot Lodge changed course to argue that Filipino men, in fact, were not fit for self-government. And here is where you can really see the gendered language and their ideas about what it meant to be a man come to the fore. T.R. Lodge and others in their political speeches and tracts 
depicted the Filipino men as childlike and effeminate, unable to care for their families, thus unable to care for their own government and be self-governing. Some imperial tracts even claimed that Filipino men, quote, did not believe in work, and they took care of the children while their wives worked. The horror. One can especially see TR's gendered logic in his famous 1899 speech, The Strenuous Life, which was intended to shore up support for US takeover of Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. The old iron days have gone, proclaimed Roosevelt, the days when the weakling died as the penalty of inability to hold his own in the rough warfare against his surroundings. There you see some really vivid evolutionary natural selection language. We live in softer times, he lamented. The anti-imperialist men, the ones who said we should not go uh, to war in the Philippines, these anti-imperialist men, he described as the timid man, the lazy man, the man who dist distrusts his country, the over-civilized man who has lost the great fighting masterful virtues, the ignorant man, and the man of dull mind whose soul is incapable of feeling the mighty lift that thrills stern men with empires on their brains. Men who shrink from duties of empire fear the strenuous life. American, if American men, TR went on, if American men were, quote, too weak, too selfish, or too foolish to civilize, the people of Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines, he warned that the task would then fall to, quote, some stronger and more manful race. Rather than let the bolder, stronger peoples pass us by, TR thundered, let us as Americans boldly face the life of strife, resolute to do our duty well and manfully. For proof of the manly traits developed and enhanced by warfare, Imperialists needed to look no further than the great Rough Rider himself. When the Republicans nominated him for pre vice president in 1900, one delegate praised Roosevelt for his life to us as an embodiment of those qualities which appear everywhere to American manhood. And as you all know, he often brought Rough Riders with him and pictures of the Rough Riders on the campaign trail. Now, we've talked about, or I've given you one example that we can think about of where I see gender involved in TR's thinking about foreign policy. What about domestic policy? Where can we see this in some of the domestic policies? I suggest that we can best see TR's commitment to virile masculinity as a national character trait in his enthusiastic promotion of large families, which, strange as it may sound, was a hallmark of his presidency. In fact, to Roosevelt, the promotion of large families was the domestic corollary of imperialism abroad. As he wrote in National Life and Character from 1894, unquestionably, no community that is actually diminishing in numbers is in a healthy condition. And as the world is now with huge waste places to fill up and with much of the competition between the races reducing itself to the warfare of the cradle, who's born the most? No race has any chance to win a great place unless it consists of good breeders and good fighters. Good breeders and good fighters. Foreign policy, domestic policy. TR also imbued the social, and social Darwinian ideas of his era, namely that life was a series of competitions in which only the fittest would survive. His boyhood triumph over asthma showed that he was a survivor. But social Darwinism interpreted competition in terms of both individuals and groups. It would not be enough for one peacock to survive. The whole group had to thrive. And TR's cohort of elite white men were not looking so good. As TR watched the birth rate drop among native-born white people down to just 3.1 babies per family in the 1890 census, the lowest it had ever been, TR feared a nation and a race in decline. Roosevelt's promotion of large families was often voiced in terms of so-called race suicide. Roosevelt became familiar with the idea from essays he read in the 1880s written by Thomas Wentworth Higginson. But the term race suicide was coined in 1901 by the sociologist Edward Ross. 
It referred to fears among white Americans that their race would soon be outnumbered and outpaced in terms of military might and world leadership by people of color whose birth, whose birth rates were not falling at the same rates. As president, TR took to the hustings to argue that men and women who had fewer than three babies, four and five were the ideal, he said, were traitors to the nation. His interest in large families became a national priority after a letter he wrote to an individual woman went public and was reprinted in Everybody's Magazine in 1903. In this letter, TR wrote that men and women who deliberately limited the number of children they had were, quote, a criminal against the race and should be an object of contemptuous abhorrence by all healthy people. Women must recognize that the greatest thing for any woman to be is a good wife and mother. For the duration of his presidency, Americans flocked to TR to show them their babies, to show them pictures of their grandchildren. They held up signs at his public appearances saying, no race suicide here. They sent letters and birth announcements to the White House chronicling the births of their children and their grandchildren to show that they were doing their part as Americans. At the American Congress of Mothers in 1905, TR gave an expanded overview of ideal motherhood. Here he also stated, and he linked the, the family to the nation. The fate of the family equals the fate of the nation. The most pressing concern in America, TR said, is the question of how family life is conducted. No piled up wealth, no splendor of material growth, no brilliance of artistic development, he said, will permanently avail any people unless its home life is healthy. And unless the average woman is a good wife, a good mother, able and willing to perform the first and greatest duty of womanhood, able and willing to bear and to bring up as they should be brought up, healthy children, sound in body, mind and character, and numerous enough so that the race shall increase and not decrease. That to TR was the primary most important duty of women and how they could show their patriotism and their citizenship in America. He said a woman's task, of course, was not easy. No, nothing worth doing was easy. But he said, having done it, she will reward, she will have the reward prophesied in scripture for her husband and her children, yes, and all the people who realize that her work lies at the foundation of all national happiness and greatness shall rise up and call her blessed. Again, the family is a national priority. What women individually do in their families is tied to the nation's progress. Here we see TR's gender ideals, the brave soldier, the good fighter, linked up with the brave mother and the good breeder, given national importance and priority. A nation was only as good as its men were good fighters and as its women were good breeders. Similarly, TR was an empathetic and heartfelt progressive reformer. This is why so many of us find so much to admire about him. He was so optimistic and hopeful about America and what it could be and how we might help get it there. But the reforms he supported most enthusiastically were those that supported his ideal version of the home, males as provider and protector, females as mothers and caretakers. Through progressive reforms, TR's nation state stood in as the male protector, stood in as the husband and the father, when the husband and father individually could not get the job done. According to TR biographer Kathleen Dalton, when TR chose reforms, he imagined the nation state as the agent of protective manhood, guarding sacred domestic motherhood, which is what convinced him to support women and child protecting policies. As president, um, we learned last night uh, from President Mitzel that TR um, endorsed many progressive policies, including <clears throat> the report on the condition of women and child wage earners and the establishment of the Federal Children's Bureau to oversee matters related to child welfare. And throughout his career, he also took a very vocal and dare I say feminist stand against rape, wipe abuse and prostitution. As New York City Police Commissioner, he said he wished rape could be punished more harshly, and he did not voice any sort of boys will be boys excuse that was so common during his era. And he suggested the public flogging for wife beaters. Even more laudable, while he oversaw raids on brothels, he recalled that, quote, insofar as the law gave me power, I always treated the men taken in any raid precisely as the women were treated. And this was really unprecedented and iconoclastic. 
Holding men and women accountable to a single sexual standard of conduct had long been a goal of female reformers, and TR was one of the first and most vocal male supporters of this, at the time, radical shift. But at the same time, TR railed against the rising divorce rates, and he criticized women who sought divorce as weak, perhaps not realizing at the time that most rapists were also husbands. He reserved his most ardent censure for women who advocated and practiced birth control. Over time, TR's views on large families tempered somewhat after members of his female brain trust, and these were largely women uh, labor reform leaders, after these brain trust women convinced him that among poor families who could not care for many children, large families were often a death sentence for the mother and a path to nowhere for the children but he could not get his head around the idea that women of means would refuse to have more than three children, even though he personally knew and was related to many such women. In his 1917 anti-Wilson book, The Foes of Our Own Household, TR devoted an entire chapter to birth control. He was inspired to write by a recent study of the birth rates of Harvard and Yale graduates. T to TR, the news was grim. Harvard and Yale graduates, all men at the time, because women weren't allowed to go, were not reproducing at nearly the level they should be to promote what TR considered racial fitness. And the women who had graduated from women's colleges like Wellesley and Vassar reproduced even less frequently. Were they not even teaching these women domestic science, TR asked? What are these women learning at college? Among these educated communities where one or two children was the norm, TR sensed a moral failure. Quote, a complex tissue of causation in which coldness, love of ease, striving after social position, fear of pain, dislike of hard work, and sheer inability to get life values in their proper order all play a part. The many female objections to TR's promotion of uh, large families can be summed up as easy for you to say. <laughs> Birth control pioneer Margaret Sanger also took issue with Roosevelt's promotion of large families. And even though I've worked a lot in the Margaret Sanger papers, I hadn't found this particular exchange until I did a search on the wonderfully new digitized TR archive here and found these materials that were new to me and very fascinating. <clears throat> Sanger had come to birth control activism after watching her mother bear 18 children and die before the age of 50. And after working as a nurse in the tenements of, I'm sorry, the mother was pregnant 18 times. She only bore 11 children, but pregnant 18 times, bearing 11 children, dying before age 50. And after working as a nurse in the tenements of New York City, where she witnessed poor women struggle with frequent pregnancies, husbands who would not take no for an answer, and babies whom no one could afford to feed. After attending to one patient who died after a second self-induced abortion, Sanger devoted herself to birth control, and she was repeatedly arrested for violating the Comstock laws, which prohibited the circulation of obscene materials. In a 1916 speech that I saw in the TR archives digitized here, Sanger contrasted the reception that she received for her talks about family size compared to TR's much publicized talks about family size. She said, we know that Theodore Roosevelt goes up and down the country urging women to have large families, and he is neither arrested or molested. And yet I am persecuted for urging small families for people of the poorer classes who cannot afford to have a great number of children. If it is wrong to tell young women how they may have small families, how much worse it would seem to urge them to have large families. As TR bi biographer Kathleen Dalton has noted, no one in TR's family except for Alice saw that TR's pronouncements on race suicide had stood in as his attempt to keep modern women in their place. And I think we'll hear more about uh, Alice and TR's about TR's views about race suicide from Stacy. But wait, I think I can guess what many of you are thinking. Many of you are thinking, TR supported suffrage. Jane Addams introduced him at the 1912 Progressive Party because he was going to bring the vote to women. Right? That's what you are thinking. And that is exactly true. 
of course. TR did support the vote for women, and that was a huge reason why women flocked to join his campaign and support him in 1912. But TR did not come to support the vote for women because he thought of women as individuals deserving of equal rights, the right to say or think as however they please, the right to engage of discussions about tariffs and warfare and protective policies. He came to support the vote for women after not really supporting it for a very long time, and we can discuss this later, because he came to believe that the nation needed strong mothers to help take care of the families, just as a husband needed a strong wife to help him run the house. <clears throat> because TR did not really see women as individuals, only as part of the family unit. So he could not really understand why some women wanted the vote so urgently, or what it meant for them to be left out of the nation's affairs even though he himself was never more depressed than when he had been sidelined from the action. In TR's Darwinian worldview, women were, be protect, were to be protected and provided for by men, either in the form of fathers, husbands, or government. So yes, he did eventually support the vote for women, but mainly because he thought they could better contribute to American family life as voters, and because he thought they needed government protection. <clears throat> For example, there was an incident when uh, TR told his reformer friend, Fanny Parsons, that he imagined women in politics would be great at campaigning for pure milk legislation, long a progressive goal, because women understood babies. This is great, of course women should vote, they'll be able to bring about reforms like pure milk. Well, Fanny Parsons told him that, quote, she had no intention of limiting my activities to milk for babies. <laughs> TR was stunned, what? Interestingly, however, just as the Bible can be interpreted in many ways, so too with evolution. So TR's version, the predominant interpretation of evolution, was not the only way people read it. Many turn-of-the-century feminists and women that I write about seized on other aspects of evolutionary theory to argue the exact opposite about what men and women should do and about what it was natural for men and women to do. They, in particular, protested TR's claims that female domesticity was natural, while male vigor was a natural corollary. The woman I'm writing about now, Helen Hamilton Gardner, wrote, if we all now accept Darwinian evolutionary theory, as most uh, educated Americans came to do at the end of the 19th century, she said, how can it then be described as natural for women to be the annex, the subsidiary of men? There was simply no mandate for female domesticity among the animal kingdom. If you look to the animals, you see a wide variety of sexual practices, domestic arrangements, childcare. So how could you draw a clear line to female domesticity? Gardner and other turn of the century feminists highlighted that women's dependence on men for food, for shelter, for survival was unprecedented in the natural kingdom. They even went so far as to say it was unnatural. Surely, they argued, this must mean it was unnatural, too, for women to be sequestered in the home and removed from remunerative labor. And just as a side note, Helen Hamilton Gardner also went on to fill um, TR's former seat on the Civil Service Commission, becoming the most uh, highly paid and highly ranked female uh, appointee in government. So they're linked in that way as well. So she could be included as one of the, if, women, if TR were a woman uh, from last night. Moreover, women argued, if women could support themselves economically, then and only then would they be able to choose the most fit mates for themselves. And they argued that women who had developed themselves more fully as self-sufficient humans would give birth to better, healthier, more developed babies with better potentials. Such arguments came to the mainstream with the 1888 publication of Edward Bellamy's best-selling utopian novel, Looking Backward. Looking Backward took as its premise a community where uh, female choice of mates was the norm and where women worked for money right alongside men. And then again with the, 19, it was, sorry, with the 1898 publication of Charlotte Perkins Gilman's Women in Economics, which we learned about last night from Virginia. Women in Economics went through seven editions, was translated into seven different languages, and was frequently used as a college textbook in the years prior to 1920. 
In this landmark book, Gilman drew on the exact same evolutionary ideas that animated TR's pronouncements about gender, racial hierarchy, race suicide, evolutionary fitness, but she argued the exact opposite things about what this meant for women. In order for women to assume what they said was a more natural role in life, Darwinian feminists proposed a redistribution of domestic labor. As I mentioned for inspiration, these women looked to the animal kingdom for examples. Here they found brave lionesses who fought to provide food, male sticklebacks who builds the nest for the young, safeguards his wife and offspring, and is an excellent helpmate. The stickleback, women said, provided an excellent example to the many irresponsible husbands much higher in the scale. Antoinette Brown Blackwell, the first ordained woman minister and the first woman to write a response to evolutionary theory, suggested in particular that since the females of all, in all mammals provided nutrition for the offspring both in utero and later through breastfeeding, it was only natural and fair for men to not only provide but also prepare the food for the rest of the woman and children's lives. After all, she said, this was only natural. Blackwell noted that she had been able to achieve so much professionally because she and her husband equally shared domestic duties and care for their six daughters. Gilman was not so lucky in the husband department, so she sought out other solutions to allow women to both work outside the home and be mothers, such as cooperative kitchens and communal apartment homes where the domestic duties were shared among residents, lessening the duty on each individual woman. But at the time, such proposals were condemned as too radical, even though their interpretations of evolutionary theory were just as scientifically valid as the more popular ones advocated by TR. At the turn of the 20th century, gender roles were in flux. TR's version won, but it was not the only option on the table, nor was the victory of the TR version inevitable. In many ways, we still live in the world that TR helped to make the world of good fighters and good breeders. Since the death of TR in 1919, dozens of progressive reforms, meaning both progressive in the TR sense and progressive in the more modern sense, dozens of progressive reforms have passed, including countless measures that benefit women and children. But none of these legal and cultural shifts have directly challenged the widespread conviction that women's primary role is maternal. Or put another way, that domestic and child-rearing tasks are best performed by women. Congress and the nation have repeatedly refused to support meaningful legislation that would help working mothers. Objections to federally funded child care centers were the only equity legislation that President Nixon refused to sign in the early 1970s when he passed a slew of other bills about equal pay and equal access. And objections to de-gendering motherhood were what tanked the Equal Rights Amendment, first proposed by TR's ally, Alice Paul, in 1923. The 1908 Mueller versus Oregon Supreme Court decision, which Virginia mentioned last night and which TR ardently supported, did provide protections for working women, but it also defined women as a separate class under the law. It defined all women as mothers deserving of special protections. Writing for the court, Justice David Brewer expounded on the juridical and political necessity of separate laws for working women because, quote, as healthy mothers are essential for vigorous offspring, the physical well-being of women becomes an object of public interest and care in order to preserve the strength of the race. Brewer's brief set the long-term, long-standing legal precedent that women would be considered a class by herself rather than as a gender-neutral gender subject alongside men, regardless of whether or not the woman in question had any children of her own. All women are considered as mothers under these statutes. Like TR, the overwhelming majority of Americans continue to profess support for women's equality, in theory, and especially for equal pay. But we remain ambivalent about proposals that would turn the abstract principle of equality into concrete policies. The fact remains that working women still make substantially less than their male counterparts, and do twice as much or more childcare and housework as their male partners, even in families where both spouses work. 
Many commentators, including Sheryl Sandberg, Bridget Schulte, and Anne Marie Slaughter, the author of this Atlantic article and a recent book um, where she develops this theme, many commentators believe that this so-called second shift for women, their second job at home that they do after their nine to five job at the office, accounts for the persistent glass ceiling in corporate boardrooms and in elective politics, even more so than structural barriers or gender discrimination. So they are saying essentially that it's not that we don't have more female CEOs because there's legal or structural barriers, but because of the demands on working mothers are so high, women simply don't have time to become CEO when you have the target list and the grocery list and the pickups and the drop-offs and the laundry and the dinner running through your head all day. An even more recent study finds that the gender gap in pay is largely because of motherhood. So despite the fact that the vast majority of women today, even mothers, work outside the home for pay, there has not been a corresponding shift in the amount of domestic labor they are expected to perform. Can women be both people and mothers in the same way that men can be both people and fathers? Can women be both equal and different? If so, what does that look like? TR and his contemporaries advanced many policies, had many debates on this topic. What policies and practices would best support this equality in theory and in practice? And I'm hoping that we can figure this all out today during the Q&A. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Who has questions for Professor Hamlin? You know, I have, I'll start and then I'll come back to you. So, I'm just so confused and I hope you can help sort it out. Because we, we chose this topic and we've all done a bunch of reading and looked at his quotations and there, aren't, there, are, not, there are not enough good books on TR and women. But he seems to be kind of all over the map. On the one hand, he's a feminist. And he's saying in his senior thesis, women need not take their husbands' names and so on. And then on the other hand, he, he's, he seems ridiculous talking about five, six, seven children and wanting special tax breaks for such people and condemning childless couples. And, and then on the other hand, he seems so earnestly in favor of reform of women's conditions. He seems like an actually sensitive man. How do you try to figure this guy out? Because it, it doesn't seem like it holds together. You gotta stay close, um, yeah. I think we can interpret TR in a wide variety of ways. He was in the public sphere for 40, 50 years. He wrote countless speeches and articles. His, his views evolved over time. Um, and also, so he may have changed. He may have said one thing in 1880 and a different thing in 1915. And I think that we need to be sensitive to these nuances and changes over time. It's not gonna be a yes, no, black, white answer in many cases. And also scholars themselves debate this. I think that Stacy's gonna present us with a different view and a different interpretation of TR's views about women, motherhood, and race suicide. And that's great, that's healthy. That's why we are here, right? Um, but in terms of how I, how I frame and understand these seeming contradictions in TR's ideas about women, I think that the through line, the theme here is motherhood. That to TR is the most important duty of all women, whether or not that is a duty that women wanted for themselves. So yes, he supported some women's right to have professions, but mostly if those women were barren or spinsters. He knew that there were some smart women who simply didn't find a suitable mate, or that some husbands were so awful, although he didn't really, I mean, we never would have advocated divorce, but that some husbands might have been so awful that you would, maybe would have chosen to not have children with them. So in these extreme cases, he talked about extreme cases in many of his speeches about truly, truly exceptional women, then it was maybe okay. But for the vast majority of women, the best thing that they could be and hope and do was have many babies. Again, regardless of if they wanted to or if this was their life's vision, and even regardless of the fact that he saw the depression that having many babies caused his mother, the health struggles it caused many other women, and the ways it was a, a life of presumed domesticity was super stifling also for his daughter Alice, that many women were not seeking this out at the turn of the century. They wanted to live uh, the strenuous life with TR. So it's a 
it's a tricky business, but I think the motherhood is the through line. He saw families as the unit of the state, not the individual. But of course, his own first wife um, died two days after birthing her first child. Yep. And then he never really mentioned her thereafter. Do you, do you see him as a person who's... Well, wait, can I stop you there? But that, that's the corollary. That's why he's always stressing brave soldiers and brave mothers. It's not like he didn't know the dangers of childbirth for women. He saw it firsthand. Then again with Ethel after the birth, um, Edith, after the birth of their sixth child when she had to have like an emergency surgery. It's not like he didn't know, but he thought that that was the corollary. Men's duty is to go fight bravely, risk death in battle. Women's duty was to fight bravely, bravely and risk death in childbirth. Do you think he's a person you know, we know his, he had a great intellect, and we know he read voraciously. Is he, is, he, is he searching to have an integrated view of family and womanhood, or is he just yes, all he, of Yes, yes. I, I think his view is pretty well integrated. I mean, he, there's tweaks and shifts in terms of his position on women's suffrage or his position on precisely who should be having four, five, six, seven babies, but it's pretty integrated in this good fighter, good breeder... <laughs> Uh, strong mother, strong soldier model with the family being at the core. And with the family at the core, as I mentioned, did lead him to some, what we would consider say, feminist stances about prosecuting male Johns right along with prostitutes. I mean, that has never been sort of the norm. So he, that was more of a, a feminist position and it was round, gr grounded in his commitment to the family. When he went to Harvard, he wrote letters commenting on the practice of many of his um, elite peers to take the train, the streetcar, to certain houses of ill repute, and he did not go along with them. He did not think this was okay. He did not think boys should be boys or sow their wild oats. Even though in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, doctors, even some ministers prescribed this as the thing to do, that boys had these natural urges that they couldn't um, take out in other Social prescribed ways. Social release forms. Yeah, right. so that was fine. But so TR never bought into that, which I really think is a credit to him. I mean, he advocated always for a, a, a single moral standard for men and women. There was a question here. Yes. Go ahead, sir. Speak up. Professor Hamlin. Um, first, an anecdote about the Philippines. Uh, I had the pleasure in uh, three decades ago, 1988, of interviewing in Manila, a uh, female member of Congress in the Philippines. And she said, uh, uh, as an aside, with regards to the amount of work done in the Philippines, that first the physical work is done by women, then by water buffalo, <laughs> then, <laughs> then by children, and then by the men. Yeah. So perhaps that's uh, still something that's being observed uh, in, in the Philippine culture. And that was really what set TR and his companions, uh, they thought these men cannot be manly enough to self-government, exactly. Go ahead. That's regards great. to uh, Margaret Sanger, yeah. in your presentation, she's rather sympathetic if you just regard her with regards to her clinical and compassionate viewpoints. But uh, as your talk uh, spoke with regards to uh, TR's viewpoint through the racial lens, would you address her viewpoints through the racial lens? I sense that Theodore Roosevelt would have ad advocated big families if the father could provide for them and if the mother could care for them that if they came from Southern Europe or from the Slavic countries or were uh, European Jews, he would have advocated large families. Can you speak to the racial motivations or even the, the racial uh, 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 hyperbole and propaganda of Margaret Sanger? I think everybody heard that. But yeah. Um, I'm sorry, for, for the video, please. Oh, so the question is about, um, so TR race, suicide, and so on. Is there a racial element or is it mostly an economic element or how do they mix about large families? For Margaret Sanger, when, at the outset of her career, it's all about economics and based in her work as a nurse. Um, and the, the things about Margaret Sanger and race come up a lot, especially in modern times, in modern debates. Um, and I would encourage people to read some of the biographies of Margaret Sanger and to study the context of it and see that for her time, she was among the less racially motivated um, health reformers. Not to say she wasn't at all racially motivated, but um, when she talked about limiting families, she was talking about preserving the health of women and also the health of families and what she wanted to do at the core, especially when she set out in the 1910s and 1920s, was to provide for 
poor and working women the same access to control their family size that more well more well to do women that these women uh, from Wellesley and the wives of Harvard men who are somehow mysteriously only having one or two children what did they know that the women on the lower east side did not know and how could she help spread that information and she wanted to make sure that poor women could control their fertility because yep. otherwise it's an economic yep. disaster and unhealthy for them and the over children over here yeah yes. relation with his mother Mitty and, and her role in preventing Thee from fighting for the Union cause. To that I will say stay tuned for our next speaker and we'll see you in a few short minutes. I think that Stacy is going to cover a lot of that and I don't You don't want to I don't want there. exactly so we will we will all be in for a treat in a few short minutes. Another yes here. <laughs> I'm looking to the window. Oh, of a conservationist. So conservation, so the ecological effect of having giant families. Oh, that's a great question. Huh. That's a great question. I have not read the documents like with that lens. So I don't know. Have you? Do you have a sense of, was there a, a, any place or any instance where he compared the health of landscapes and the help, health of herds with his thoughts about families. I don't think he connected and human population. Especially in this, in this Darwinian context when people were very much explicitly thinking about human-animal kinship and the, the similarities and differences between humans and animals. You would think that that might have, yeah, that's a great point. Stacy, what did you, what do you? Well, here's why I think that, um, there, we still saw more of the pull of wild spaces. So they yeah. were willing to expand. We weren't worried about population, population control. Oh, that's true. That was a slightly later. There's yeah, historically that came up as a concern later. Seventy-five million yeah. Americans on a vast continent. So yes. Yeah. So that's a great point. Okay. Let's go ahead. And one of his most striking images is of the womb of time. And he talks about the fact that the people who exist now and who have existed are not nearly as numerous as those who wait to be born in the womb of time, and that that's why we preserve. Them want them to understand the nature of wilderness mm -hmm. when the world is, in fact, crowded. So plenty of land for the womb of right. time for the unborn right. is, is his point. Yep. Last, last chance, yes? Does there any more need to be said about the contradiction of uh, the number of kids that his, wife, or the, his daughter's had as opposed to his lost his daughters did not have notoriously yeah. big families. Well, I, and I think that Stacy will talk about that too. The only thing that I will say to that, and I tried to uh, kind of allude to this in my talk, is that he promoted this ideal that really hardly existed anywhere around him except for in his own household. So he had six kids. His wife was awesome. His wife ran the show, and his sister helped, and they had servants. So he, in his teeny microcosm, this six-kid model works, right? But when he looked to his friends in the reform movement, when he looked to his cousins, when he looked to his daughters, the model does not work out so good. So I think it's, it's interesting that he continued to press it, giving so little evidence, except for his own personal, um, that it is a, a good working model that people were interested in pursuing. <laughs> Kimberly, I have just one last question, and then we're gonna do a book signing and take a oh, break okay. for 15 minutes, Great. so thank you for that. But So his two clo the two men he was closest to in life, his father, Thee, uh, and Henry Cabot Lodge were not the hyper-masculine new men. They were yeah, the, the old older men. model. They were the yep. lot. You would never think of Lodge in a no. cowboy outfit. Right. And I'm sure he thought Roosevelt was ridiculous. Right. So <laughs> why? And that's why T.R. liked him so much, right? Is they were they this contrast, yeah. So, this, so, he, so yeah. his allegiances are yep. still with the effeminate model of manhood, well, even not, though he's breaking with it. He wouldn't have called those men effeminate, I don't think. They were this older, traditional version of masculinity. The effeminate men were the more like... The the 400 Club. And some of his sons, who, right. you know, the, and even his earlier self, who was sick, came down with neurasthenia, couldn't 
withstand the pressures, the dilettantes of society. But I think, um, yeah, he liked that version of manhood too. I don't know that was his favorite though. Um, I mean, he chose, he revered his father obviously, that was his closest friend, but he also did a lot to seek out manly men um, in the Dakotas, his rough riders, when asked to choose the kind of men he wanted to spend a lot of time with, he actively, I think, also wanted to engage with and imbue the, this more macho version. I, I guess my question is, how, did how, he how ridiculous is Roosevelt? Because in a certain <laughs> way, he's ridiculous. You know, he's a, he's a, a patrician <laughs> who's out here doing this stuff and putting on designer clothing and pretending to be a cowboy and so on. His closest friend, Henry Cabot Lodge, wouldn't be caught dead in yep. that gear. So th that's what's fun about Roosevelt, yeah. but it's also a little weird. Well, I mean, that's why I wanted to highlight the Houdini and the Tarzan and the Sandow. I don't think it was ridiculous. I think they're in the historical context, TR was really prescient in observing these trends, in impersonating, imbibing, imbuing these larger forces and kind of becoming the apotheosis of them. He promised to tell us about this penis thing. <laughs> I mean, it's just what you would imagine. So Bernard McFadden was another one of these male um, virility proponents at this, around this time. And he had a magazine called Physical Culture that was kind of about bodybuilding. And in the pages of Physical Culture, you can see advertisements for his penis scope, which, as you can imagine, was supposed to um, enhance your virility. It was a contraption that you could affix a, a to yourself. Also, and we don't need to get into this, but this was not uncommon. Um, if, there's a great book called The Body Electric by my friend Carolyn Della Pena, where she talks about some of the um, early uses of electric belts and how they too were um, to promote virility. So nothing you probably would want to imagine today, but it was not uncommon to seek external as well as internal um, enhancements for male virility at the turn of the 20th well, century. Well, you have brought to our symposium <laughs> bearded ladies and penis sculpts and- You are welcome. Who knew? <laughs> Thank you.